Dave Bedini uh, of the Rio Statics, the Bedini band. Uh, one of those folks who knew Gord really well, and we're very pleased to be joined out of the gate by Mr. Bedini. Dave, how you doing this morning? Well, that's a that's a silly question. I kind of know how you're doing this morning. It's a tough one, eh? Because I think we all sort of knew. I mean, I go, go, when Gord first got sick, he he told me that. Uh, he was hoping he could get to spring and, you know, he was strong in spring. And so I think for, for friends, you know, any time kind of after that was, was an amazing bonus. And he was really, you know, uh, very present and, and active and, um, you know, in that time after that, and it's only really recently that he's kind of slipped out, but uh, yeah, it's tough because, you know, personally for me, I start thinking, and I know coming on to, talk to you guys i start thinking about you know just moments on the ice with them and stuff and and and, and watching sports and doing the annu- annual fantasy draft and stuff and how much you know how how absorbed he was in the game and and called the culture of sports and and conversely how much he sort of i think did for our enlightenment when it comes to perceiving the game a certain a certain way kind of tilting it you know out of those shadowy kind of jock only times when you know it was just a bunch of you know lunkheads kicking around a puck now it, it became a little bit more about art with gord and i think that really helped mm-hmm. move our country along you know I, I like the word i like the phrase tilting it Dave, because that's kind of what gord did right like it's you know it's it's kind of the prism held up and, and kind of bending the light that's that's kind of what his art was in a lot of ways whether you know whether you however you want to what, whatever aspect you want to talk about it um uh, what, what you want to talk about in terms of the art Gord Downey created? I think that's what he did. He bent the light. And it, yeah, and it takes a strong pair of hands to be able to do that. I mean, you guys and uh, know how entrenched you know sporting culture can be and has been in Canada for many years. And and listen, it's not it's not dissimilar to the parallels of rock and roll too. When when the hip and the Rios were all coming up, you know, we were dissuaded from singing about Canadian subjects by the Canadian music industry. Right? It was all about. You know, listen. If you replace, you know, the the town, if you replace Halifax with Los Angeles, you're going to have a more sustainable career. And <laughs> um, you know, uh, a lot of the same things were going on with sport, where you were told that you couldn't really address, you couldn't talk about the game or write about the game in a sensitive light. Right? Um, it was all kind of the old, you know, died in the woods, very, very sort of man, manly prose and manly view of of sport when in fact sport can be a beautiful, vulnerable, vulnerable, sensitive and and tender thing. Um, Now that said, I was thinking about playing with Gord about a decade ago, we were doing like a a men's beer league tournament in Whitby. um, And uh, at one point in the game, there was a a guy from the other team who was standing in Gord's crease. And I remember thinking that, Oh, you know, the guy's probably asking for an autograph or is, you know, bugging Gord because he is. So I thought I would go in there and run a bit of a, Interference. Well, it turned out they were actually in an F in an FU fight. The guy had like clouded <laughs> Gord in his crease. Gord had slashed him. Gord was calling him every name in the book, um, and and he, t- you know, so there's some guy out there who got in an FU fight with somebody who didn't realize it was Gord Downey. But he took the game so seriously, and I remember that that game we went into a shootout, and he, he got burned uh, for the deciding goal, and he was uh, inconsolable for uh, a good half to half hour after that we went down by the river and we had a couple of beers and talked about it but he really was he, in everything he did he was so devoted and he he poured all of all of all of himself into into whatever his enthusiasm was uh we are uh joined right now by our friends along the sportsnet television network uh gord downey passing away uh at the uh at the age of what brent i can't read from here at the age of 53, 53. Uh, today, joined by Dave Bedini of uh, the Bedini Band and Rio Statics. I, I got to ask you, the one thing that has always amazed me about Gord Downing, the tragically hip, this guy's from Kingston. Um, I mean, I grew up in Manitoba. And, you know, I, I got a thing with Dave with every band I like. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lyrics guy almost as much as I am the, the music guy, the notes guy. You know, and, one of my favorite lines, you know, Tom Petty from Rebel is, you know, one foot in the grave, one foot on the pedal, which is, if you've ever been in the southern states, is that's the way you live life. But when Gord Downey and 100th Meridian and the Tragically Hip sing about Corduroy Road, I mean, the, I, the first time I heard that, I wrote it down in a notebook because I've driven down Corduroy Road. We've all driven down Corduroy Roads if you're, you've been in the prairies. We, we all know what it's like. Some of us have hit the ditch on it. What is it about Gord Downey? 
that made him able to speak to guy in Manitoba, guy in Saskatchewan, guy in Newfoundland, guy in Ontario, or woman in PC, you know, woman in Manitoba, woman in Saskatchewan, woman in Ontario. I think for us, I think for us genera- generationally, um, growing up in the 70s, I'm 54, Gord's 53, um, we were taught throughout, you know, geography and history school that Canada was really boring. And we were told that, you know, we were this pallid cousin of the United States. We certainly got that through media. We got that through television. Uh, we still do to a certain point. So when, when, when bands like ourselves, and especially maybe even more so with, with Gordon, being uh, being from Kingston, a smaller place, when you actually got a chance to get out on the highway, free from your town, free from your family, free from your suburb. Um, I, I know for us, going into going into Regina was like going to Paris. It really was because it was this distant, exotic place on the uh, literally the other side of the world, even though we we're in the same country. But it would take you four and a half days to get there. So I think you know it was a chance to sort of see Canada differently and sort of. Gord and the Hip were, uh, were able, and, and that whole generation van, of bands were able to embrace embrace Canada as an exotic thing, as opposed to a very stiff plaid uh, entity that that, that 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 the way it had been shown to us by our by our by our parents. And it's really when you get when you get to the small places that's that's resonant, you know, like. Um, and, and Gord was such a great, he had such a great way of looking into the corners, you know, seeing through the seams, peeking between the houses, right? And he put in the work. Listen, guys, you know, we would, on tour, we would walk uh, in the middle of the night, wherever we were playing, we were playing. That was a big thing. It wasn't really, the hip weren't really ever a really big party band, you know, family band in a lot of ways. And so that's what Gord would like to do would, would just be to, you know, I remember just standing at one night, one night in Saskatoon, just standing in front of the window of a used bookstore and just looking at the books, like the you know, books about tractors and books about farm equipment and him being so sort of taken with that. And I was like, Gord, really, it's only farm equipment. But he was, <laughs> there was something about what, the way the blades looked on the thresher and, you know, and great minds are able to pull those details out, and and he was able to show them, show Canada back to us in a way we hadn't seen before, and that's a beautiful gift. Dave, I, I was I was having a beer a couple of weeks ago with one of the guys who'd been around the band from right early, early, early days, and I and I asked him, I said, well, when did Gord become Gord? You know, that when did he become that guy on stage? Um, and he said he was that guy the first day he walked on stage. That when they were playing cover tunes, he was Gord. He was the that that whole persona was fully formed the stage persona was fully formed do you remember like what's the earliest you remember hearing them play well i remember hearing them and, and on, to be honest their first album wasn't much it didn't seem like much and and gore will tell you this too and he is he's he talked about it and have not been the same um the the, the anthology of canadian music from the 90s but there were a lot of progressive strange bands happening in, that were happening in the city here and um I think he was able to, he, he, he drew inspiration from a lot of different sources. Um, I think stage persona wise, he was always this kind of uh, vibrating doorstop, you know, mm. very alive and very active. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure when he came by the town. I just think he getting out, you know, getting out of Kingston and, and hearing all of these, listen, cr- crossing Canada and playing is such an interesting experience because you're meeting bands from all points, right? So, you're meeting that, and, and, and it's such a it's a, such a thin sort of passageway. So many bands are crowded into that passageway, and everybody's playing the same clubs. So you'll meet, you know, the weird ska band from Montreal, or you'll you'll meet, you know, the progressive Celtic band from Nova Scotia, or you'll meet, you know, a freaky Danny band from Northwest Territories. You meet everybody, and that all kind of gets poured into it. So I think that's I think Gord would have evolved out of those experiences. Um, in terms of, you know, his, just his vocal approach on stage, I think it's a little like, you know, a comet hitting the earth, right? It's one of those rare, beautiful uh, moments when art just finds, finds its portal, right? Is that, that it, 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 he, it's, it consumes this person. I also do think it's, it's, it's a product of working really, really hard. Like those guys would have put in thousands of hours before anyone, uh, knew, 
gorge for who he is. He, mm. you know, you know. So, um, but again, you put in those hours so those moments can find you. And um, and it's also, I think it really flatters the Canadian public. People always talked about, well, I didn't hit make it in the states, but it flatters us that they made it here, right? And again, yeah. for a long time, we were a listening public that just would go to see cover bands and top forty bands and would buy records by Triumph. God bless them. But we we didn't have very <laughs> progressive, adventurous tastes until the hip came uh, along and showed us that it was okay. But you know what, Dave, one of the things I like about that, and I, I, I think, yeah, that's maybe maybe it flatters us as a culture, I don't know, but there is certainly, you know, he hits a note that we, only we, he hit a note that only we could hear, I think, in some way. But, yeah, um, you know, I like the fact that, that, that it's that it's art born in a bar, not born in an art school. You know, and, not, and that's not slagging any of mm. the great bands that started in art schools, you know, and Mick and Keith, and, uh, you know, Mick was at least an art school guy, and, you know, David Byrne, that was, the talking heads were formed conceptually, right? But these guys, you know, it starts with, like, the world's greatest bar band and kind of evolves out of that. That's, I, you know, I think that's part of which, what makes this band interesting. Well, which, and that's a very, very difficult parlor trick, too, you know, to be yeah. able to switch. Yeah, it's then maybe, you're right, in a lot of ways, aesthetically, that's one of their greatest achievements. And listen, and being a successful uh, bar band, uh, in the uh, you know the late '80s is not the worst gig ever. You're getting paid better than bands that are playing you know 15 minute uh, epics about you know the Manitoba Prairie. Like it's so for them to kind of push and go more and more and more. And and Gord was the you know he was the uh, the vector you know at the front of that you know that the vector of geese. Like he was at the he was the lead bird. Like everybody flew you know, uh, after him. And he pushed that band and pulled them to new places. I don't think it was hard for them to get on side, but, you know, there has to be somebody who steps forward, and he, he was one of those persons as well. In conversation with David Bedini. Dave, before we let you run, I did want to ask you, musically, why why did their songs, why did their songs, why, why do their songs resonate so much with us, and why are they so timeless? Like, you know, with all due respect, and I, I mean this, I love the first EP. That's, that's, that's my favorite hit. Is the first EP, Last American Exit, you know, one of my favorite songs ever. But musically, for for those for for music fans who are listening, why were they so good? What was it about how they wrote and how they sang? I think they were a true band, really. You know, they were such a cohesive uh, unit. Everybody knew their role. It's not like not unlike a great you know starting nine or a great hockey team where you know people know what their job is and they know how to do that job well and they work together and i think a band that stays around together and is successful and rises through the you know the great times and is able to sort of fall together and make their way through the rough times is a is a great example just for us as a society and us as people we can get along you can take you know, four or five people with different musical interests who do different musical things and get together on the same page and, and, and work together and are successful um, doing one thing really, really well, despite the fact that they've been around together for 30 years. You know, it, it shows us a lot that, you know, if we persevere and stick together and believe in what we do, we can do anything. And that's certainly one of the legacies of the band and one of the legacies of Gord. Dave, uh, we're going to let you run. Uh, I know it's uh, it's going to be a, a long day, a tough day for you. We really appreciate you giving us uh, some of your time today. And, okay, I really guys. mean that. Thanks very much, man. My pleasure. Great talking to you. All right.